right. So um, welcome, everybody, to Photography Made Easy, a, an active adult uh, Zoom a virtual class on learning how to increase our skills when it comes to photography. Today we're going to be talking about candid photography and I thought that this was a fitting subject or a fitting topic because we're getting close to the time hopefully that all of us get to see their families and take pictures of everyone as they are opening gifts and uh, just sharing in, in each other's um, rep, you know okay. uh, situation being close to each other. I'm forgetting the word for it. Uh, but um, before we start, Dorothea, how do you have a DSLR or do you just use a smartphone? What does your camera look like? Okay, excellent. I have an icon, yeah. Okay, and how often do you take pictures? Um, believe it or not, I used to take photos, but it was so long ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember a whole lot anymore. And okay. so... I, I really want to get into taking photos uh, mm -hmm. seriously. Um, so I figured that this would be a great, you know, opportunity for me to get into it. Um, of I course. Have, uh, this one I got real inexpensive and- mm -hmm. um, What, um, I know you said it was an icon. What's the, what's the code name on it? So like I have a, I have an icon as well. Oh, okay. um, and mine's on the left-hand side here. It should say like a D7, D something or. Yeah, it's a D7000. Okay. All right, good. So we're actually really close. I have the D7100. Okay. Um, so I think mine's just that little step up. Um, and it, the only thing that's really different is I think it has um, more focus points. Uh, it was It was really recommended for when it came to. Uh, animal photography or journalism when you're taking a lot of action shots. So that's why I, I first got it. So what did you take pictures of? Um, I mean, what, what did you used to take pictures of and uh, when you had um, your camera back in the day? Just random things. And mm -hmm. um, I had, I, ha I also have a D3000, D3100, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And I just used it because I, I I was a graphic designer uh -huh. okay. in a previous life. And um, so I just used it to take little random photos, mm -hmm. of food, um, you know, just basic things. Right. Okay. And, and kept it on auto the entire time. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I didn't really take advantage of the features in the camera. And so... Um, yeah, I, I, I totally get that. I mean, I, I actually did also used to use the a Nikon D3000 when I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, that's what I used for photography in our journalism class. And even learning as much as I did during that class, I still find myself nowadays, you know, whenever I just want to take a picture, I just put it on auto. Don't, if you don't feel bad about taking pictures on auto. It doesn't make you any less of a photographer um, just because the camera's doing, you know, half the job for you. But that's, you know, that's why it's there. It's like, it's like telling somebody that they are bad at math because they choose to use a calculator. Yeah. It's not gonna, you know, it's not. <laughs> um, great. Um, so uh, one last question for you. What, uh, what's, the, what's the millimeter zoom on your lens? Um, it looked like it was a short zoom. I'm going to guess 35 to 70. I have, I have the 30. Let me get it real quick. I have the 35 um, to 70. Mm-hmm. It's, well, I have a 35 millimeter here. Okay. And the one that's currently on it is uh, the 55 to 200. Okay. And then I've got a third lens that's in the bag. Um, right. And that's probably going to be that short range. Okay. Yeah. So you have, you have your prime lens, you have your short lens loom, and then you have your long range zoom. Perfect. Yeah. Those are, that's, I mean, that's, that's an excellent starting point when it comes to, um, you know, just, making sure you cover all your bases, you know, and, and doing it affordably as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, that's going to be good. And, and you definitely have um, the lenses that you need when, uh, for our today's topic being candid photography, your 55 to 200, um, as long as you're not really getting close to somebody, that will probably be, I mean, that'll be a really good lens to do. You can shoot a picture from, you know, a couple, uh, not a couple, uh, five to 10 feet back. Okay. Um, when you're in that sub 10 foot range, when you're kind of, you know, in the, in the area, 
of the subject, then I would definitely recommend shifting to your 35 to 70. Okay. Um, your prime rent lens is good. Um, you know, prime lenses are great because you, you get your subject in focus and you get your background and your foreground all out of focus because, you know, your prime lens is just for that 35 millimeter. It's just that length. Yes, I love, I love using that because mm -hmm. of um, it, what I had learned with the other camera is the depth of field. I like mm -hmm. having that fuzzy background. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and I oh, really yeah. That's yeah, and so the, the 35 millimeter prime lens will also work really well for Candid, but you're definitely going to have to be more aware of your positioning um, and the positioning of the subject. Because when if the subject starts to move towards you in the zoom lens, it'll be able to adjust to that. But with the prime, if it gets too close, then the subject becomes fuzzy and then you're having to you know, move around a lot. So, okay. um, But you can definitely get excellent pictures. You know, Candid photography is essentially just taking pictures that are real, that are frank um, and that are without the knowledge of the subject. Uh, you can still be candid when you know a photographer's there, okay. but it's very hard, you know, cause you're subconsciously thinking, oh, I got a smile, the camera's pointed at me. And then when you force yourself to smile, it's a fake smile. Even if it looks genuine, even if it looks amazing, like it's just wonderful smile. If you force yourself to smile, then it's considered a fake smile and, it, and you know, it's technically not in that candid realm. Um, and when, when, when you're taking pictures as a, as a candid photographer, as we'll, we'll frame ourselves the rest of this class, you need to be kind of like, um, imagine yourself taking pictures of, of an animal in the wildlife. You know, you want them to be natural. You don't want them to know you're there because as soon as they know you're there, then they act in accordance to you. They act as if they have to do something because you're there. Um, so for the most part, you know, candid photography, you're really looking for that natural feel. You want the subject just to be doing what they're doing and you happen to just take a picture of that moment. Um, kind of like when people always imagine or say, you know, I wish there was a camera in my, um, in my uh, contact lens or I can take pictures of my mind, stuff like that, because those are really where you get those moments of just pure joy, pure emotion without any sort of fakeness, with any sort of facade brought up. It's just all, it's just all natural. Um, and so. I, I guess I wondered about that in terms of, um, you know, especially now people being uncomfortable with, with people ca capturing them mm -hmm. um, randomly. I was just, I'm like, I wonder how, how that works, getting people, hi, <laughs> uh, getting people um, without being too intrusive on people's mm -hmm. space, you know? Right. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that later. I have, you know, today's um, class is going to be broken down. We're going to go over just generic stuff, settings, equipment, you know, kind of bring everybody up to the base point and then we're going to I'm going to show you 10 trips or 10 tips um, to help you become a better candid photographer um, and and we do at the very end we talk about taking pictures of strangers and um, the only thing that I say you don't, shouldn't do is you shouldn't really take pictures of strangers children that's usually the general no-go people always get very defensive when you take pictures of the children um, but outside of that, I mean, when you're taking pictures of other people, as long as you're not making yourself so aware or so obvious that you're taking pictures of them, more often than not, they're just not going to pay you any mind. They're going to think that you're taking pictures of something else. And we'll talk more on that later. Um, so let's go to our next slide here. And that's going to be breaking down equipment. So you can do candid photography from, with any kind of equipment, but it does make it a lot easier um, if you have a DSLR or a camera, at least with a lens. Um, having a lens gives you a lot more variability and a, a more ability to adapt to your surroundings. Um, so having a 35 to 70 is going to be your better um, zoom lens. You're going to be able to get close to the subject as well as decently far. Um, of course, you could always have something that goes from, you know, up to 200, but then that restricts your ability to get really close. And more often than not, your candid photography is going to be taking place closer than it is far. Um, even with a 70 zoom, you can take a picture that's far away. And then in post-editing, you can crop your picture and 
blow it up. And then as long as you know you had a good focus, it'll look as if you were a bit closer. Um, but of course, the, the, the best lens you could have, and these are not cheap, so I don't expect everyone to really go out there and, and grab one today, is, a, is an 18 to 200 telephoto lens. These range from about 1,000 up to 1,200, 1,500, 2,000, depending on the, the brand, depending on the, um, the aperture, how low the f-stop it is. They can get very expensive. Um, when you see the pictures of people taking pictures of, um, of like uh, spiders that are on a log and you can see them in full focus, they are getting those with these telephoto lens because they allow you, because they have that 18 millimeter start point, they allow you to get that close to the subject. And because it goes all the way up to 200 millimeters, you can then zoom in when you're that close. So I think 18 millimeters is, a, is about, you can be in focus about a foot to two feet away. And 200, um, 200 millimeters, you could be in focus 200, 300, 400 feet away. You know, it's like looking through a sniper scope. So if you are two feet away and then you are zooming in as if you were looking through a sniper scope and things are in focus, that's how you get that real crisp, small, like um, beautiful pictures. It really gets down to it. So, I mean, if you ever had a, had a you know, you luck into some money, you win the lottery and you really want to increase your photography, a telephoto lens is going to be the best buy you can make because you can use a telephoto lens with an with a affordable camera and the same way you can use it as with a very expensive camera. And your lenses will last a lot longer than your camera will. Typically, um, I know my Nikon, uh, the life expectancy for it is about 150 thousand shutters meaning you can take 150,000 pictures and then you're going to be it'll it'll you'll start to see a degradation in the equipment usually it has to go with the motor with the shutter um, you can replace things but at that point if you have that old of a camera um, then you're most likely just going to want to go and buy another camera um, but you know I'm not trying to tell you guys how to spend money here that's not the goal here you can you can do Canon photography with your with your smartphone. Um, and it's gonna be a bit harder to take pictures, um, particularly in taking lots of pictures, particularly in taking pictures from farther away because smartphone zooms don't really do it. They don't zoom in as well. Um, but for when it comes to a holiday party, when it comes to a, a, you know, a small little party get together where you're gonna be in one big room, your smartphone will work just as fine as your DSLR will. Um, so don't feel like just because you don't have a DSLR that you can't take part in candid photography in general because you definitely can. Smartphone cameras today are as good, if not better than cameras that I used when I was in high school. Um, they're just so advanced and cameras are like one of the biggest selling points for when it comes to uh, smartphone makers. Samsung, Apple, LG, Google, they use their camera as one of their big buying focuses, meaning you're you're going to buy that camera because you, or you're going to buy that phone because you wanted that camera. Because when it comes to the inside workings of all these smartphones nowadays, they're pretty much the same. Everyone is using the same technology, but the cameras are places they can really differentiate. Apple cameras are really good at um, low light situations. Samsung cameras have really pushed the boundaries of how um, zooming and your variable, like of how many cameras you have. I think the Samsung uh, note right now is the camera that is the phone that has the most cameras and it has five different cameras and it just allows you to have such a, a wide ver a variety of, of um, opportunities that you can take pictures with using your smartphone so don't feel as though you need to have all this equipment but if you're using a DSLR 35 to 70 millimeters your lens of choice um, and if you're using a smartphone camera something that is um, more up to date is going to provide you a better situation, better pictures, of course. Um, and so uh, last thing we do before we get to these tips is settings. So always make sure that you avoid using a flash when you are taking candid photo uh, photography. So candid means natural and flash is the anathema of, um, or the, the opposite of natural. When you are in the middle of a room and somebody takes a, a flash photography, everybody in that room has now become aware that you are taking pictures and they are gonna be self-aware of that. 
They're going to be conscious, self-conscious about the fact that they're going to take pictures. They're going to make sure they are kind of keeping an eye out of you as you walk around the room. And it's just going to ruin your ability to take true candid photography. Um, you want to make sure that you, uh, if you're shooting in auto mode, most of, often your auto mode has no flash. So you can um, set it to like a no flash auto mode. I know Nikon has it. It's, it's the one that looks like it has a, a lightning symbol with the flash through it. If you're in your smartphone, change your smartphone from flash auto to flash off. Most often than not, we take pictures a whole day um, and your camera will never take a, a flash. And so you just assume it's off, but all the, you know, it's defaulted to being an auto. So the, the computer in your phone will just determine whether or not it's, it's an ideal situation to take flash. And sometimes, or actually all the time when you're taking candid photography, it is not ideal. Um, additionally, some smartphone cameras and some DSLR have more special modes. Um, this is not, this is talking about um, uh, on Nikon, they call it a scene. And so you can go and you can go to the scene for taking pictures of people, or you can go to the scene of taking pictures in low light situations or of a party. And that's going to just adjust your settings to better fit that. And it's going to be like a different auto mode um, because it's going to be more aware of of your, of your situation and, and it will have preset kind of boundaries to stay within. Um, additionally, you can also, um, if you want to set your settings manually, the biggest thing to look out for is your shutter speed. You want to make sure you have a faster shutter speed because you want crisp pictures. Because of this, you're going to have to adjust your ISO or your aperture. Um, if you bring your aperture lower, it's going to allow more light in. Um, and usually when you adjust either your ISO, um, I'm sorry, I totally messed that up here on the, on the PowerPoint. It says you need to adjust your higher. You need to adjust your ISO higher and you need to adjust your aperture lower. Um, and more often than not, if you adjust one of these, you have to adjust the other. And the best way to do this is when you first get to a, a party, have your, and your host is, you know, always arrive early um, when you're looking to take pictures and your host is walking around, they're taking, they're doing stuff, they're fixing everything up, take pictures of them and adjust your settings. You know, take a picture with a low ISO or a, a low, a high ISO or a low aperture and see how it looks and then slightly adjust things until you get that good situation. More often than not, when you're indoors, your lighting situation is gonna be the same. And people aren't gonna really choose to turn on more lights or turn off, you know, turn off more lights. Um, and so you, when you set it up at the beginning of your, of your photography, you know, when you arrive at the party, it's going to work out for you for the rest of the time. But always check back after you take some pictures, check every now and then and making, make sure that your settings are, are good to go. Um, one last thing, there are ways to have an auto mode that you set um, only partial of your settings. Uh, so if you look here, and I'm going to show you, I have a Nikon, so this is what we're going to be demonstrating with. Uh, here we go. So you have all these M, A, S, P. So M is manual. A is aperture priority, meaning you set your aperture to a certain set time, and then the auto mode will adjust um, the other settings. Same thing with shutter priority. It's going to set your shutter and you're going to adjust the other settings. And then you have uh, P, which is programmable and you can just program it um, depending on your situation. Um, those are, you know, those are very advanced. If you get into that, it's, you know, learning more about your settings will make you a better photographer, but you can be a good photographer without knowing anything more than just auto mode. Because half, actually I would say 80% of photography is your eye. Making sure you have a good eye for situations, knowing when to take the picture, knowing how to set up the picture, um, you can also make your pictures look great post editing through uh, software, stuff like that. So don't feel like you have to set your settings because it can be, it's, it can be very a daunting task. And as you're starting to get into it, you know, you can kind of spend too much time adjusting your settings and then you miss all these great photo opportunities because you just wanted to, to, you know, have the perfect setting. You know, sometimes things aren't going to be perfect, but they're still going to be a perfect situation or a perfect photo. photo. So, so we're going to get into the um, tips and all my tips are going to sound like I'm shouting at you because I kind of am. So tip number one, always be taking pictures. You will not get can candid pictures if you are not 
ready in the right moment. Start, you know, if you, if you just, if you wait for an opportunity to present itself, then the opportunity will already have passed because you're going to have to get your camera up. You're going to have to turn it on. You're going to have to focus and then you're going to have to take the picture. And that could be, you know, you could be really quick and that could be a millisecond of time, but that millisecond, that opportunity could be gone and somebody's sm nice smile could turn into a, and then you just don't have a good picture. Um, when you arrive your, to your event, have everything ready, a full battery and an empty memory card. Um, if you know that it's going to be a very long event, sometimes you can bring two memory cards if your, if your camera can support that or if you can just plug it in every now and then. You can also adjust the quality of the pictures. Um, I take pictures on full quality. Uh, so each of my pictures usually is about the size of six to eight millimeter, mil, uh, megabytes which is pretty significant for a picture. Um, if I shifted it down to medium, the uh, pictures are about one megabyte. That's about the quality of the stuff that you see on Facebook. Um, I'm sorry, not Facebook. Like if you were to send a picture through the phone, there's still gonna be good quality. However, as you, um, if you were to zoom in on it, you'd start to see more pixelizations. The larger you make the picture, the, the less quality you, you or the more quality you lose. Um, and then, of course, you make it a small or poor quality or just simple quality. They're probably going to be as, you know, the size of, of something you upload to Facebook. Um, and so just to give you guys a, um, a feeling of how the different um, camera qualities will affect how many pictures you can take. I can currently take 1000 pictures on my camera right now using full or using um, uh, fine or, or high quality pictures. If I adjust my image quality to normal, I can take 2000. So it doubles it. And if I can adjust, if I adjust my image quality to basic, I can take 4000. So you kind of imagine you can double the amount of you can pictures you can take as you go on. Now we're also going to talk later about um, taking raw pictures. And um, raw is, is, um, it's called a R A W. And it is for whenever you're trying to post edit or, or edit your pictures, you really want to have your have the, as much um, information when it comes to what's stored in your picture, it's like image data as you can. And for that, you're gonna need to have your pictures taken in raw. Now you can't share a raw photo. You don't post a raw photo to Facebook. You don't share a raw photo over your messenger. A raw photo is specifically made to go straight into a post editing or post processing software for you to edit. And then in that software, you would save that as a JPEG or as a PNG or something. Um, and raw stands for, sorry, I forget. I know it's um, raw image format is, oh, raw stands for raw meaning it's like an uncooked steak, something that hasn't been fully processed. Well, here I go, thinking that I was gonna have to answer some trivia here. Um, another thing to have, whenever you have a camera strap, you can buy those camera straps that hang around your neck. Um, but as for senior citizens, you should be very careful with how heavy your camera is. If you have a really heavy camera and you have a, cam and a neck strap, it can be very uncomfortable. You can start to have pain. And because it's right on your spine there, it can, you know, if you have back issues, this can kind of exaggerate, exaggerate, exacerbate your back issues. Um, they have hand grips, uh, or you can wear your camera strap underneath as like a across your shoulder underneath your armpit. You can still, as long as it's loose enough, you can still pick it up and bring it up to your eye. And you can kind of bring it down a little bit to about mid, uh, mid chest level if you're trying to take a picture down here. And as well as whenever you're walking around, you can kind of bring it off to your side as if it's like a fanny pack. And almost as if just a better way of blending in as you're keeping that camera out of somebody's focus. When somebody looks at you, the first thing they're gonna see is not that camera strap. Um, another thing to do if you, know, if you wanna, uh, you don't have to, but this does help blending in, flip your camera strap backwards so that it doesn't say the big bright Nikon or Canon letters. Everyone is aware, I don't think there's anybody in the world that's not young that doesn't, that isn't aware of who Nikon and Canon are. They are the biggest camera makers out there. If they see that, the first thing they think of is you're a photographer. 
Um, you can get your own a custom uh, strap. Those are always fun. Um, and then you can also get hand grips so that you're holding the camera in your, in your hand. Um, but I definitely, I recommend having an additional, some kind of strap elsewhere that you can rest yourself because you can't eat at a party if you have a camera in your hand, unless you have a spoon attachment at the end of your lens and you're using it to eat your, <laughs> eat your meal. Um, uh, I'm trying to think there also are shoulder, uh, chest straps, they wrap around your arm. So you kind of put them in like you're, um, like you're doing those little water wings for toddlers. And then the camera sits here on your chest and it has enough slack to bring up and then it goes down. It's a lot easier on your shoulders, um, you know, easier to see, but of course it does lead it to, it's always gonna be right there in front of you. They're gonna see it all the time and it's gonna uh, go against your ability to blend in when it comes to taking candid photography. So, all right, 30 minutes in and we are tip number two, so. <laughs> And feel free to ask any questions. Um, don't forget to unmute yourself if you do feel like you need to ask a question. We have as much time as we have. I have nothing else the rest of my plate when it comes to classes, so I can stay here until five o'clock helping you guys if you really wanted to. I will probably lose my voice well before that, but um, I'm happy to help and share everything that I can. So tip number two, taking lots of pictures. The digital age has made it so much easier for for your ability to increase your, your skill in a camera because you can take picture after picture after picture after picture after picture and there's no downside to it except wearing down your camera but more often than not you're not going to take that many pictures. Um, you know back in the day when you film you had 20 whatever you know shutter depending on how, how your film canister how many uh, pictures it had you couldn't see what kind of pictures you were taking um, you could practice with it, but then you, you know, you had, there was a, you had to go and get your film developed. You had to pay money, or if you did it yourself, you had to go through that whole process. And then you would look at the picture. And at that moment, you just, you lose that ability to, to look at a picture and adjust what you're doing in real time. And digital photography has made it so much easier, has made photography become just a, a hobby versus a career. Um, you know, for most people, it used to be like you could be a photographer as a hobby, but you really had to dedicate yourself to being a good photographer when you were doing film photography because there are so many ways you could do wrong. Um, so nowadays, with the benefit of digital photography, you take lots of pictures. If you're using a DSLR, your camera should have the ability to um, adjust your shutter speed. So where you have, and it's it's very similar on Canon. So where we have our um, our settings knob underneath is your shutter speed dial. And so you can kind of see here, I'm on CH and that's gonna be continuous high. And they have CL and then they have S and they have a lot of other ones that are more special. You have also have a timer there as well. Um, I like to shoot on continuous high and that typically means that when I hold the focus and I hold the shutter button down, when I were to take one, just like a click like this, it's gonna take two to three pictures. And they're very quick. And the great part about that is that you're gonna be able to see like if somebody's like slowly getting into a smile, you will capture that perfect moment when they have that perfect smile somewhere in there. And then you just have to delete. You're gonna to have to get used to deleting a lot of pictures. That's just how it's gonna be. Um, and the one way to help you if um, instead of having to go by and delete every picture and delete every picture, the ones you don't like, it's easier to go through and, and lock the ones you do like. So there's a lock button on your back of your camera when you're viewing your picture. And then you can just format your hard drive and it'll delete everything you didn't have locked. And that way it'll save the ones you wanted and delete everything you didn't. Um, and so that's just, it's just a little, little way to you know do it, but you're just going to have to get used to going through your pictures, it's a lot easier to go through your pictures when you upload them to your computer. Um, doing it on your camera, it, it's just slow. Your camera is really not meant to do editing. You can you can view, but it's meant to be really a, just a, a quick glance um, when you're looking at your camera. Um, so taking more pictures is always gonna increase your chance for that one perfect shot. There's really no harm when it comes to taking lots of pictures. And if you're using a smartphone, um, they have burst mode. That's where you hold the button down and it takes a ton of pictures. And the best part about smartphones when it comes to burst mode is that your gallery isn't gonna get filled with like 80 pictures. They're typically like saved in one picture. And when you open that up, you can flip through them 
and find the one you want and then save that one out of the burst. Makes it really easy when you're doing, uh, and that, but that's for your smartphone. You're not really gonna have that option on your um, DSLR. What you're gonna have is you're gonna have to be able to inc increase your shutter count speed and it's gonna go into your, your high shutter button. So um, lighting, 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 using ambient lighting. So we talked earlier, never use flash. Our eyes will, our eyes are hypersensitive to light. When you walk outside, your eyes start, you know, we have good night vision, but it takes time to adjust. And, you know, when you're in the dark and your eyes are um, exposed to a very bright light, it, it messes up your vision. And that is the reason why when you're in a party and someone takes a flash, everybody notices it because everybody in that room had their vision just reset and things are, you know, things are going to look different. More often than not, people aren't usually happy whenever their vision are reset. So using a flash not only will make them aware of you, they're going to make them a bit upset at you because people just don't like, unless you are ready for a flash photography, people don't like flash photography. Fishes don't like it. Animals don't like it either. Flash photography is, is there when the subject is aware and when the subject's not aware, you should not be using flash photography. Um, so when it comes to ambient light, you need to make sure that you are planning around the light that's available. And, you know, this is just another reason why I always say arrive to your party earlier, because that's going to be your best opportunity to, to get a good look at your lighting. Um, when it comes to ambient lighting, they also, because they're typically, ambient lighting is typically um, less intense, and that's going to cause more shadows. Um, and uh, you just want to make sure that when you are walking around the room that you are aware of where the light is and where the light casts shadows. Because you don't want to take a picture of somebody and their whole face is in shadow because that doesn't help you. It just makes it harder for you afterwards. Um, you also need to be aware as well, when you first arrive to the party, um, the lighting will change slightly as more people fill the room. Um, you know, somebody across the room from a light may be in full light when there's not a lot of people there, but as more people fill into the room and more bodies are just blocking the pathways of light, then that person on the other side of the room is going to be less light, is going to be less, um, you know, less lit up, and you're going to have to adjust your settings accordingly for that. Um, typically, whenever you first arrive to a party, you can set your settings, and I would say after about an hour or two, or at least when everyone's there, take a moment to readjust your settings and make sure that you're really adjusting to that, to that good lighting situation. Um, ambient lighting is very difficult to work with, but once you get into it, it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not finicky, it, light is light, you know, once one light is always going to be the same way, you know, a lamp will always look the same, will always give off the same light unless you change the light bulb. Um, so that's the great thing is you can plan for it to be constant and you can adjust yourself around that. So tip number four, and this specifically has to do with DSLR because smartphone cameras always handle your autofocus um, just on its own. It's done by AI, um, artificial intelligence. So this is really going to focus on people using DSLR cameras. So um, for most people, you're going to have two autofocus modes. Now this is, I, I won't be able to point you in exactly how to change this right now because it can be, it's, it requires figuring out where the buttons are, um, but you can figure this out if you have your camera manual. It's, it's listed in your manual, very easy step-by-step -step to follow through that. So you have two types of, of autofocus. Um, you have the single point autofocus, means that whenever you are pressing your autofocus button, the camera is going to focus on one point and that's going to be its point of focus. No matter how many pictures you take, no matter how you move around, that's, that it stays there. And then you have continuous autofocus. And that is um, essentially that when you focus on something, your camera kind of identifies what that shape is. And as it moves around, it will do its best to stay focused. I'm not going to say it's perfect. Don't expect that if you take a, if you focus on some object that's really far away and then they move a significant, you know, left to right and move closer and forward to you, it, it's going to be able to stay in focus within a certain parameter and then it's going to unfocus. Um, it kind of look at it as, you know, if I did single point, I have my, this is this right here, this is my one point of focus. If I did continuous focus, then I can focus on everything within this circle. And if something moves around, it's always going to stay in focus. But if it 
pops out, then all you have to do is just refocus it on it. And it's going to, you know, it's going to adjust its circle around there. Um, so just be aware of that because it can just be very disappointing when you go back at the, after a party's done to, to look at your pictures that looked great when you were taking the picture and then they just, you know, were just slightly blurry or just slightly off or, you know, they, they moved just, just a hair of an inch and then just the whole picture was ruined. Um, and especially Dor uh, Dorothea, you're going to be, a, be aware when you have your prime prime lens. This is a big thing to be aware of. Um, having a continuous focus on the prime lens will help a lot, but moving front and back, the distance between you and the subject, that is something you'd be very aware of when you're using your prime lens. And um, a prime lens for everyone else who's listening is um, a, a DSLR lens that is, it's one number. So it's 35 millimeter, it's 18 millimeter, it's 50 millimeter, it's 100 millimeter, meaning that the lens is, folk, is great for that one distance away and everything else, both things that are before, you know, between you and the subject and as well as things that are beyond the subject are gonna come um, more blurred as they're out of the depth of field. It leads to some really great picture opportunities. I love using prime lenses. Um, they are slightly affordable as well. You can get a 35 millimeter, um, brand new for I think $200 and you can typically buy it on marketplace for about a hundred. Um, and the great thing about prime lenses is because they don't have a motor in it, because they don't have really any focus that goes into it, you can get one that was built in the eighties. And as long as the mount still works for your camera, the lens will still be good. Um, when it comes to zoom lenses, the older the camera, the older the lens, it's just going to have some, it's just going to, it's, you know, a lot of moving parts, things break over time. Um, but there's really not any moving parts when it comes to a prime lens. So moving on, blending in. True expert photographers have just mastered the art of, you know, like a, like the Pink Panther, uh, those movies where the, he's just there, you know, he, he moves off the wall and, and, and moves out of the room the second you move, you, you, know, you stop looking at the wall. They have just, they've taken their time to, to make themselves less intrusive on somebody, to make themselves, to make subjects less aware of them, um, you know, and, and it's really easy to do. You just, there's a lot of things that you have to be aware of. The way you look plays a lot of part into it. Um, picking something clothing on you that's not bright and vibrant. You want to make um, dull, not dull pick, uh, colors, but like um, plain colors, gray, a blue, like a solid color. And then, you know, just some, you know, regular pants or, or you know, not a, not a crazy outfit that's going to draw attention to you. Um, you also want to make sure if you can, you know, kind of keep your camera out of, you know, don't always have your camera up in your, up in your eye. Okay. Um, you want to, you want to anticipate moments. You want to make sure that you're ready. But at the same time, if you are constantly looking through the camera lens, everyone's always going to be thinking about you being the photographer. And, you know, they're going to look at that and they're going to see that, you know, they're going to give you that fake smile and it's no longer going to be candid. Um, sometimes, and, you know, blending in, you know, is also, it's also not being noticed, but it's also when you are noticed that you're not, um, you, the, the subject's brain doesn't really process you. So when you are taking pictures of somebody or you looking at somebody, and this works a lot with strangers or also at a party, don't look directly at them. You're looking at them, but don't ever make eye contact. Make it a habit of yourself to look past them. Because when some, when I, you know, speaking personally, when I look at somebody in the crowd and I see that they're looking at my, my, my way, my eyes kind of just gravitate towards them. And as soon as I focus on them and notice, oh, they're not actually looking at me, I just look away. Uh, they're done. My brain has said, okay, they're no longer a threat. They're no longer a whatever. Um, I don't need to care about them. I look away. And that works excellent for, for photographers because if you can master that way of just making somebody pass you over as if you just weren't there, then you're going to be able to get those true, natural, full emotion pictures on your subject because they they're just going to be acting like as if they do. They're just normal everyday life. They don't, and they don't think that there's somebody taking a picture of them. Um, and it makes it a lot easier if you're further away. People don't, people aren't going to notice that you're taking pictures of them across, from, you know, across the crowd, but you with a zoom lens can be as if you were right up there with them. And so you're going to be able to get those candid photography, you know, candid photos from far further away, a lot easier 
than when if you were right up in their face. Um, but there are ways to take pictures really close without them really noticing you. And, um, and I'm gonna talk about that in about two or three tips, they'll come up again. So photograph, uh, photograph people with people or people doing things. Somebody just standing on their own can make a really good picture. The candid photos don't have to, you know, when, when we say that we're looking for a picture full of emotion, that doesn't mean that it's an active emotion. You can look at somebody and they can be full of gloom. They can be full of sadness. Those aren't gonna be really active, really moving around emotions. You know, somebody can just be looking off into the distance just, and you get that full, like you get all the emotion they're trying to give to you. Um, so, you know, and sometimes you gotta push your subjects to, to get those great photo opportunities. So when you're in a party, you're going to be interacting with people no matter what. You're not going to, you know, just because I told you to blend in, to act natural, doesn't mean you're not going to be able to talk to people. It doesn't mean you're not, you shouldn't also talk to people. Um, and there are ways that you can create situations for you to take pictures of. So introducing somebody to another person, especially somebody who do, they don't know each other, um, introducing an introvert to an extrovert, somebody who's really active, has just this jubilant, um, you know, personality, they're gonna be great kind of focus points for you to get good natural subjects. All you have to do is just say, hey, so-and-so, have you met my, new, my friend here? And then walk away. Walk away to a corner, walk away to a place where you know that it's good lighting for where you introduce them, and then start taking pictures. You're gonna get these beautiful, candid pictures of a situation that you created. So that situation you can consider to be fake, but the, nat the expressions on those people's faces are still gonna be natural. And that's because, you know, you, you, it's just people meeting people. You know, that people will always be more emotional when they have somebody else to talk to or when they're doing something. Sometimes you can create a great task and this works really well with kids if you break something. So maybe the, um, the nutcracker at your party uh, has a has a you know a, a, a dowel that you can take off and its mouth will just kind of fall out. Oops, I broke it. Can you help me fix this? And then leave them to do it. You know, leave them to to fix the object, to to, to put up the plates, to serve um, this these cookies to people in your party. Leave them to do that, and then you kind know, of follow them around the distance, taking pictures of them. Not only are you going to get them interacting with things, but you can potentially also get them interacting with people as well. So these are great. Um, you can do this uh, with, you know, Christmas presents, Hanukkah presents. You can just tell, hey, can you open this present for me? You know, most often, you know, when it comes to kids and especially, they're going to be so excited that they get to open up a present that there wasn't theirs, that they won't even care that you're two feet away from them taking pictures. They're not going to look at you at all. And I can say kids do make one of the best subjects because they really do they're not in that, they don't, they're not really self-conscious of themselves. They're not self-aware of their, of the way they act in public. They just like to be, they just live in the moment. And that, those are the people that are gonna give you the best candid photography. All right, move around, up and down. So changing your perspective will give you a lot of varied photos. And more often than not, having a lot of varied photos means that you're gonna have um, opportunities to, or you're going to be able to capture even more opportunities. Um, and, you know, something can be simple as moving your camera up to down. So from taking it at your eye level to taking it at hip. And when you take pictures at your hip, you need, just need to accept the fact that 90% of your pictures are going to be bad. <laughs> it's hard to, to focus when you can't see what you're looking at. Some cameras do have the LCD plate that can fold out. So, and, and kind of twists, you can have it come out and twist up that way you're kind of looking down. Um, you can also uh, turn on the back of your camera so that it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, you, you're, you're taking it at, at the hip, but you can kind of barely see uh, what's going through your lens by looking at the back LCD and having your viewfinder set through your, um, your LCD screen. Um, but more often than not, you know, the best way to take pictures from the hip is to make sure your zoom is as wide as possible. Give yourself as wide of a field of view as well, as good as you can. Make sure your lens is pointed at the subject and just keep it level and then just take pictures. 
if the subject is, is a, you know, a bit taller than you, maybe tilt it slightly up and just the more you practice with this, the better you'll get. You know, hip photography is, is a really big when it comes to street photographers because they want to capture strangers doing their natural stuff. And often or not, when you get your picture taken on the street, you kind of look at the cameraman because you're like, what is he doing? But if the cameraman is taking a picture from his hip, you won't, you, it's, not gonna, you know, it's not as noticeable. And so you're going to get better um, candid photography. Um, but, you know, putting yourselves back in the setting of a, of a party, move around the party and find those ideal shooting locations because they will be finite. When you are in one room, there's only so many places you can take good pictures from. Now, there is an infinite number of places you can take pictures from, but ideal good pictures with the right lighting, with the subjects facing you, there's only gonna be so many of those. And so you wanna take the opportunity, especially when you're taking that time to adjust your settings, to walk around, to look, don't look with your camera, look with your eyes. Your eyes are gonna give you a better field of view and then you can adjust and get that camera to capture what you are looking at. Look around, look up and down. And once you find those settings that you, or those locations, make a mental note of them. And then look, you know, later on in the party, just take moments to go to those places and just wait. Waiting for, wait for the emotion to come, come to you, wait for the action and then you know, get ready. When you're sitting in the corner of a room or you're standing still with your camera up and you know, you're just kind of in that position, your, your camera's at your eye level, you're, you're looking around, but you've been doing that for a couple of minutes, people will start to put you back into their foreground. They'll start to put you back into, oh, she's not, you know, that's not at me, you know, following every, everything else that we've been doing, blending in. And then you're going to get in a good position. Don't do this always. You know, this is kind of a uh, every now and then situation because if you spent the whole party with your camera on your face, you will be noticed because the only thing they're going to notice is your face. But if you just take five to 10 minutes every now and then to just sit down, wait, maybe find a chair in the corner of the room and just look at people and wait and, you know, get ready, anticipate the action. Because when you see that somebody's about, you know, they start laughing a little bit, maybe somebody's telling a funny story, that story is going to have a punchline and that punchline is going to cause them to laugh a lot. And if you are ready for it, then you will get some beautiful pictures. So let's go. Oh, hmm. Okay. Well, I don't have tip number eight, it would seem. Um, I'm trying to think if I, uh, let me see if I mess something up here. I don't think I did. Okay, I just messed up the the labeling of the of the tips. So, tip number eight: um, bring your camera. Let's go with that. There you go. Can't take pictures if you don't have your camera. Uh, tip number nine: practice, practice, practice. You're never going to become good if you only take pictures when you are, you know, in events, in parties, in places where you want to take pictures. You need to. Go out and create opportunities for yourself to get the experience, to learn from the mistakes that you do. And I think personally, the best place that you can do is a busy park on a weekend afternoon. When you are in a park, if you set yourself up with a zoom lens and you do your best to avoid taking pictures of strangers, don't, don't sit yourself on a hill right next to a playground. That is people, the first thing people think is that is a, that is a predator. Um, well, and you will likely get the cops called on you. But if you're in the middle of say, you know, Old Settlers Park is a good example. Um, right near next to the lake, there is a sand volleyball court. There's a bridge where people are walking. There's the lake where people are taking, fit, taking pictures, or, or not taking pictures, but fishing. Um, there's a parking lot where people are getting out of their cars to get ready. All those opportunities you can take pictures of and you're just sitting in the middle of the field in a blanket enjoying your day and nobody's going to think anything of you because you're just taking pictures. You're in a park, you're taking pictures of, of people, of things, and they may, you know, it may look your way, but you know, you're going to be so far away from them that you're not really going to ever be an issue of, of interrupting them or becoming intrusive. And the, you know, you're in a park in a busy park on a weekend. If you do upset somebody or if somebody just becomes aware of you more often than not, they're going to leave your, your area of, of, your capture area, so to say, and then you're gonna have a new subject walk in within seconds later. 
so you don't have to feel this is one of the best places to take pictures but you know if you don't feel comfortable taking pictures of strangers why not take pictures of strangers pets then dogs are great because they're always natural and you can just kind of get in that feel of of moving around of taking pictures of the dogs interacting with each other and it's going to give you a good basis of skills to build on when you eventually get to that point when you can replace dogs with people you know pets are great animals are great because they they will make it aware it's very obvious when you've made yourself aware when they are self-conscious of you because animals dogs more often than not will come up to you and greet you and then you know oh, i can't take a picture if they you know you're looking right at me um and then when you're out in nature, when an animal notices you, more often than not, they're out of there. They're gone. And so you'll notice when you, when you, you know, fail to blend in, when you lose your subject. Um, and so uh, last but not least, post-processing and raw photos. So um, taking pictures is great, but you know, really making yourself to a professional photographer, you need to be able to get post-processing software under your belt. Um, there are a lot of options out there. The best option, of course, is going to be anything from Adobe, Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Lightroom. Lightroom is more for just editing the values of a picture. Um, that's going to be, you know, adjusting uh, shadows, balance, you know, highlights, uh, light balance, exposure, sat uh, you know, saturation, noise, all that kind of stuff. That's what, you, that what Lightroom, Lightroom is going to be for. Um, and a Photoshop is going to be for more intense edits, cutting things out of pictures, um, you know, removing sm small smudges, really changing the picture from what it was to what it will be. In Lightroom, you're essentially still going to have the same picture. You know, really, you're, you're going to be able to crop, but you're not going to be cutting objects or subjects out. In Photoshop, it's, you're really going to be using Photoshop to create a whole new picture. Um, maybe you took a picture of, of this person and it's beautiful and it's great and there is a, um, a telephone pole jutting right into the middle of the big blue sky coming as if it's coming right out of their ear. Well, in Photoshop, you can just, you can remove that. And oh, they have a lot of tools that make it easy as you can't really, you won't be able to tell where you know, it was even there. Um, in Lightroom, you're typically, that you're going to need to use Photoshop to remove that light pole, but you can you know, adjust the level of the values and make the picture look beautiful. You can also do that kind of stuff in Photoshop, but um, Photoshop has a lot of tools, and if you, um, it's better to start with Lightroom and then go into Adobe because you'll be very familiar with the tools when you move into Photoshop. Now, if you don't want to pay any money, because Lightroom and Photoshop are not cheap, um, nowadays they require... Um, a, uh, a monthly subscription, which is just outrageous. I don't like the way that they did that. Um, but for the price you pay, you are getting the best software on the market. You know, uh, everybody uses Adobe. People who make movies use Adobe. People who are professional photographers for National Geographic use Adobe. So if you can capture and, and really learn those softwares, you will, you know, that's going to be a step above you know, most amateur photographers. Um, but there is an open source editor called GIMP. It's G-I-M-P. Um, search GIMP photo editor. And it's the picture of a dog with a little um, paintbrush. Uh, it's open source, meaning that, you know, it's, it's usable by everybody. Um, and it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a bit more difficult than Adobe to learn because it essentially is just a smorgasbord of tools and, um, and, and options and settings, and it's just thrown at you in a not too pleasing way. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a free program, so of course it's not gonna have that shine, the polish, but it, it has everything that Photoshop has. So if you took the time to learn GIMP, you will be just as good at using Photoshop or even better. Um, now, GIMP is not better than Photoshop, it's just a more affordable alternative. If you have the money and you're willing to spend the money and you want to become a professional photographer over just an amateur photographer, and I'm not saying um, that you're trying to make money from it, you can be a professional photographer and still just do it for your own hobby. It's just that level of expertise that we're really doing it. You have beginner, amateur, intermediate, and professional. Post-processing is above intermediate. You know, 
it, it has professional is really being good at everything that's not just taking the picture. You know, you have, it, it is a lot of stuff that gets involved in that. Um, so, uh, you know, you, but for most people, you more often than not, you really just want to do some really simple edits and GIMP is going to be what you need. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, there is a, there's a way on, on GIMP to just do auto level and it's going to automatically adjust your levels to make it the best computer generated or computer, um, the AI software in GIMP is just going to say, this is the way that this, this picture will look best. Now that, that is always a, a subjective view. Um, it's, it's, it's subjective and objective. Yes, when you do auto leveling, your picture will be better than what it was if you didn't adjust the levels, but some people have different pre preferences. Some people like their pictures to be more saturated. So you have these really vibrant colors that don't look natural, but just look amazing. You know, they look like a stained glass picture of just a, you know, a field of flowers because it's so intense. It does not look natural, but it, you know, I, some people really do prefer that. So um, you just got to get, you know, get into a feel of that. Um, but you will more often than not need to edit your pictures. And so learning at least the basics of this will help you in the long run. And if you do plan on post editing or post processing your pictures, always shoot in RAW. Always. You can shoot in both RAW and a regular JPEG. It's just going to reduce the amount of pictures you can take. Um, but nowadays, memory cards, um, I bought a 64 gigabyte memory card at Walmart for 10 bucks. Um, and when I was in high school, that would have been $100. You can buy one terabyte memory cards for 100 bucks. And I don't think you will ever take enough pictures to fill that thing up. Because, I mean, when you really think about it, if I could take a thousand pictures on 64 gigabytes, what more if I could, if I increase that by more than 10 times? I mean, that's going to be 10,000, 15,000 pictures you can probably take. Um, and if I'm taking on basic, I'm looking at 30 to 40,000 pictures. You're, it's, you know, it's, it's too much, but it can never be too much if you're, you know, it's always helpful if you have the money, you know, buy something that's, that's top end so you don't have to buy something later on. Because if you bought a 64 gigabyte now, you know, in the future, you may have to get a bigger one. And it could be that you, this, your 64 gigabyte is good for your current camera, but the next camera that you buy is going to have a, you know, files are going to be bigger. Files for, for things when it comes to the computer are always going to grow because we just are increasing the way things look. You know, you're increasing the megabit, megapixels of your camera. You're increasing the quality of your pictures and those take up space and you're going to need more space in your memory card. So I highly recommend, especially now in this holiday season, when they have deals, pick up something that's way too big than you need, and then you will, you'll be good for the rest of your life. Um, but one thing to be very aware of is when you are taking pick, when you're buying a memory card to take pictures of, always get the, the fastest memory card. So they have basic memory cards and then they have like gold or like, um, I'm trying to think I have a, oh, I don't have it with me. So like um, this one right here is 32 megabytes is the one I have on right now, ultra plus. And it says it has a 40 megabyte per second writing speed. The higher megabyte per, per second writing speed that you have, the quicker it's going to transfer those photos from your camera to your computer, as well as the better, um, you know, you're not going to have as much issue when it comes to corrupted files. Um, you're not going to have as much issue whenever you start to get your, your memory card becoming more and more full. Um, you know, I started, a, uh, started doing portrait photography for people on the weekends, and um, I do 15-minute sessions, and Maybe, you know, I'd only charge $50. And in that 15 minutes, because I take so many pictures, I typically do about 200, 250 pictures in 15 minutes. And I will, I won't have an opportunity to go home during the day. So I can only take four to five, you know, couples before I have to switch out my memory card based on the way that I take the pictures. So having more memory is always going to be better. For Christmas this year, I'm already, I'm already set myself to buy a 500 megabyte um, memory card and my camera takes two memory cards. So I'm going to be able to continue to use my 32 megabyte, which is just going to make it, you know, I won't really have to worry too much about that. But 
um, you know, when it comes to pictures. And, you know, while we're on this subject, if you were taking video, you need a huge memory card because videos on your DSLR are very big files. Um, I took a video that was 20 minutes and that file was a one gigabyte in, um, in size. You, when you get to editing that, you can break it, you know, when you process your videos later on and video editing is a whole nother behemoth to tackle. Um, it'll slowly move down and down, but if you look to do videos with your DSLR, you need to have a really big um, memory card that has a fast writing speed because when you're saving videos on your camera, it's constantly sending data to that memory card. And if you have a slow um, memory card speed, you're gonna get poor quality on your video. You may get a jump every now and then, it may just go slower, it may not look as good, what, what have you, something will mess up if you have a really slow memory card. So be sure to get fast memory cards, large, um, large size, and now is the best time to buy it because the Christmas holiday, everyone's getting cameras. Um, you know, so there's lots of deals out there. Um, there are lots of deals as well on cameras. If this is the top opportunity for you to get into becoming a DSLR uh, photographer, I know places like Costco and Sam's Club typically sell like a bundle around $500. It's going to give you a bag, a camera, a lens, uh, maybe even a tripod, a memory card, and sometimes even software to go with it. Um, Best Buy does the same thing, Amazon, Walmart, they all have these bundles. You know, you typically don't really buy a camera on your own anymore when you're a beginner. You buy it in a big bundle and it just gives you everything you need because it's just a start, you know, get ready and starting kind of situation. So, um, so I have just some candid photographer, candid pictures examples here. Um, and you, you'll notice the big thing about all these pictures I chose, nobody's looking at the cameraman. Um, so this lady right here, walking her bag down the middle of the street, you know, you have these, all this action going on, but she's in her own little world and the photographer was able to capture that. This could have been a planned candid fit picture, but they did it so well, you don't even really notice it, okay? Um, the guy at the very bottom, you know, he's not looking at the picture, you know, or the photographer, he is, you know, you're, this is one of those moments where this picture is full of emotion which is, has been enhanced by making it black and white because the emotion that he was sending out wasn't a positive emotion. He had a negative emotion. Um, kind of almost like when I look at this, I get despair. I look at um, gloom. I look at just loneliness as well. All really powerful emotions, but they're not positive. And so by adding this black and white filter to this, you know, in post-processing, they enhance that feeling of, of the emotions as part of the subject getting, is, getting, is putting off. Um, wedding photography is a great opportunity for you to get lots of candid moments, um, you know, because most often not, most subjects are busy on something else. So you can get a lot of pictures of them without even really having to you to blend in as much. All right, um, we have you know just some more black and white. I find a lot of candid photography seems to um, do really well with um, with black and white. Um, because, you know, and, and, and it's kind of a bad example because a lot of these pictures I've taken are, are more negative emotions when it comes to black and white, which black and white does excel really well with, but you can get some really good positive emotions. So the lady at the bottom, some might people think, you know, oh, she's lonely. She's reading a book, but at the same time, she's content, you know, she's getting to where she needs to go and she's engrossed in the story, whatever she's reading, um, you know, she's there, she's determined, you, know, you can see her mouth is like just set on it. And I'm sure if you kept taking pictures of her like this, you'd probably see her face change even more. And even if they were set in black and white, it would still have that really, that really nice feel to it. Um, that picture on the left, such a good picture. I mean, the use of negative space, um, black and white really does well with this. I'm sure if this picture wasn't black and white, it would still be just as good because of um, the way it looks like the lighting in here is not, there's not a lot of light on this picture. Um, and that's why even in black and white, it's so contrasted. Now, if we did have a picture like this on the left and it was a lot more brighter and you wanted to make it um, black and white, but you started to see, you know, the, the, the pillars here were uh, more grayscale than they were black, adjusting your contrast would allow you to achieve this level of, of crispness in the black and white. Um, 
And then, you know, at the top, you have all this uh, activity going on, but your suspect, right, or your subject right there is on his own. He's um, lonely in a crowd, you know, and, and the black and white exacerbated that. If you took this picture and it wasn't black and white, you would you would kind of feel less like that the subject is on his own and more like the subject is just kind of watching other people, you know, that he's just uh, passively participating in the, in the situation. Um, and so, uh, you know, here's some other opportunities. Both of these pictures would have been good black and white, but at the same time, not being black and white, you get that color to add. So the guy with the oranges, his face doesn't really show too much, you know, um, positive or negative emotions. He's kind of just doing his work. You know, this is uh, an opportunity that Starver probably ordered the drink and then just got ready to take the action, you know, wait for the action to come to them. But the the bright oranges in this picture, the oranges and the uh, the drink, that, that moment of you're getting the prize, you can feel that kind of emotion in this picture. And then the one at the bottom left, I love, um, I love the lady's pose. Uh, I don't, if you were asking me honestly, I don't think that this was a candid photography picture. I think this was more of a pose pic picture, but it could be candid. This is an opportunity where you're walking around downtown Austin, walking around downtown Leander, Georgetown, or wherever you live. There are a lot of great opportunities to take pictures of people. In fact, in this picture, you can see there is another photographer. The lady with the green hat is taking pictures of a guy who's doing his best to look as if he's not looking at the camera, doing his best to try to get that candid, that you know, nobody looking moment. Um, and so, you know, you can really make, you can plan a candid picture. But when it comes to really positive emotions, those are gonna be a lot harder to plan. Telling somebody to smile is not gonna be the same smile you're gonna get as if you just got a picture of them as soon as they opened a present or got a picture of them as soon as they saw their family member or best friend for the first time after a long time. You know, you're gonna have those, the difference in, the difference in those emotions. Um, and so uh, it is the holidays. So we have, you know, great opportunity to uh, get candid pictures and the best way to get candid pictures is with presence because their focus is somewhere else. They don't care about you. They care about the present in front of them. You can be a kid. You can be an adult. You can be a grandma. Everybody loves getting presents. Um, and, you know, the you know, good way whenever you're take, whenever you're opening presents and you're being the photographer, if you can, have both the person who's getting the present as well as the person who gave the present right there in the picture. So you have both the interaction of them with the object as well as the interaction of them with the person. You're going to get that emotion of, oh, they're going to open the present, they're going to look at it, they're going to see it, and they're going to look to their friend and they're going to, they're going to be so happy. They're going to embrace them, hug them, um, which is something they might not have done if that person wasn't right there. So that's another moment where you can create that opportunity and it still feel really natural because you're not creating the moment, you're creating the opportunity for the moment. That's a big thing to be aware of. You know, creating opportunities is different than creating moments because moments just happen. Opportunities for moments is something you can control and you still have that, that degree of removal from that situation. Um, and so that's all I have for you guys today. Um, do you have any questions at all? I do. Um, uh, Jackie had her Jackie had her hand up. I'm gonna give her an opportunity to, to ask a question. Oh. That's okay. Well, I tell you what, I'm uh, I'm uh, not uh, very a uh, very good photographer at all. As a matter of fact, I'm an awful photographer, so I don't <laughs> even have a camera. So it's interesting to learn all the different aspects. Uh -huh. But uh, probably most of the photography I take is of, of garden pictures because I'm very active in garden clubs. So we yeah uh, we, you know we have you know, posts that we do on colors of flowers and all types of things like that. Mm -hmm. But I can see where the different lenses would really help and some of the other advice. Oh, and, definitely. Uh, you know, um, this is just a tough year because everybody's got their masks on, but. Uh, oh, that's uh, that's so true. Yes. Um, yeah. I, especially when it comes to taking pictures, you know, half of your emotion is from the eyes down. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I'd say 90% of your emotion is from the eyes down. You can do whatever you want with your eyebrows, but your mouth shows so much more emotion and your face and your smile. I mean, sure. without a smile, you, know, you just have your eyes squinting. Somebody could just be squinting and you think they're smiling, but they're just trying to see something that's farther away. Um, mm -hmm. But you did, you did talk about, you know, most of your pictures is of garden photos. Do you use your smartphone? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. That's about the extent um, of it. But 
kind of opposed to getting a better camera. If right. I so they do have these. Um, they're always really fun. I'm not saying they're going to be great, but they're they're kind of fun little toys to play around with. Is they have these little clip on lenses that you can clip on to the end of your mm. smartphone, um, and they um, the really one that ones that work really well are the fish eye. Oh. So it's essentially, you just put a lens out, and and now that your camera now your camera is looking through a fish eye lens. And so its field of view is going to be like spread out. Huh. Um, and so you're going to be able to capture, like say you're, you're really close to this one flower, you're going to be able to capture everything else around it rather than just yeah. that flower. Um, and then the other thing is a telephoto lens. So it's like a really long little piece. Um, and honestly, if I were to uh, exit here and go to Amazon, they are, they are very affordable. Um, they have them even for phones? Oh yes. So it's just these little clip on things. Um, huh? You could be, they can be expensive and they can be not expensive. So typically they come with a clip and then you have a little lens you can screw onto it. So you see here um, $27 for 11 different types. Wow. So um, huh. some of our filters as well. This is the one, look at long, I mean, that's a huge. Oh loop. my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, you want to be, you know, this right here, $32 kit has the long lens, all these different things, even comes with a tripod and a remote shutter. Um, and those, you know, they're, I'm not going to say that these are great lenses because they're, you know, they're coming yeah. from China, they're coming from wherever, they're well, very affordable. I don't want to be, a, I don't want to be a professional, but I, I'd like to be right. a better hobbyist. But they're, know? but they're fun, they're fun to just try around with, especially because yeah. smartphone cameras, you know, you're always kind of feeling like you always have the same kind of camera. Um, additionally, as well, you can download apps that will that will kind of like digitally uh, change the way that your camera looks. That you know, just you know, so don't feel like just because you don't have a DSLR doesn't mean that you can't you know have, take great pictures and um, and you know and, and have lenses as well. Um, yeah, so you know, it's it's yeah. Well, I appreciate like you said, it's informative, and I, I was I was just typing as you were. Uh, finishing up that I was going to have to drop off, but I, I I found it very informative and gave me a lot of oh. stuff to, th to think about. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Well, thank you for coming by, Jackie. Uh huh. See you later. See you later. All right. Um, okay. So your question. Oh, I was just going to ask about. Um, you talked about Adobe Lightroom. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask, uh, because Lightroom is just so expensive, mm -hmm. are there any other um, uh, tools, maybe open source, that you could use um, to yes. do some of the preliminary tweaking? Mm -hmm. um, the best way, and I always, I'm a huge proponent of Google, so I, if you can still see my screen, it just says I looked up Adobe Lightroom alternatives. And so okay. we're gonna go right here. Um, the best alternative Lightroom alternatives for 2020. Okay. Uh, so let's see, we have, um, so some of these are gonna be expensive or some of these rather not expensive, but they're gonna have a price. Okay. But for the most part, a lot of them are gonna have, um, you pay once and you get, and you keep it. So okay. that's the great thing about it. So. Um, Here's one, Skyloom Luminar. Uh, so if Photoshop like layers, um, has AI based tools, um, and it has, uh, you know, it has um, just a lot, a lot of tools that makes it really simple. Um, so it says here, if I'm not mistaken, I guess you can, you can get Lightroom for $10 a month which means it's affordable, but then, you know, you're going to be keeping that. So after two years, you spent $240 and you can buy Luminar for $69. And then you have it for the rest of your time. In fact, um, I go to this one website that uh, it's called Humble Bundle. Um, and for a lot, it's going to have a lot of games um, because it's, it's just meant to be, it, they basically, they sell games in bundles. And then when you buy from them, they give money to charity. Oh, okay. But they aren't just, they are not just um, games. And in fact, if they still have it, um, yes, they do right here. Okay. So uh, you, we were just talking about Luminar uh -huh. and I'll post this in the, um, the thing. So for $1, you can get Photo Lemur, which is another photo editing software. Okay. Um, and it says here, it's taking the concept of photo enhancement back to earth and complex processing for photo handling 
to as many people as we, it's a, um, it's quicker than standard operating software, meaning it's likely used for lower, um, lower, uh, be, like less beefier computers because Photoshop and Adobe Lightroom do take a lot of power from your computer. Um, more often than not, if you have just like a regular small laptop, you probably won't be able to use Photoshop to its fullest, uh, you know, extent. So, I mean, this is, this is about as affordable as you can get $1 and you get this, um, you get this, uh, this uh, software and then it goes, it kind of goes on tiers. So um, if you pay $21, then you get uh, all of these are just extra stuff that you can add into Luminar. Okay. And this is a book right here. This is some textures that you can add. That's kind of like um, Photoshopping stuff. Uh, and then you pay $25 and you get Luminar 4, you get Aurora, which is for Mac. Um, you get all these extra stuff that adds into Luminar, all this stuff. And this one is supporting the um, whale and dolphin con con conservation as well as be the match. Wow. Um, and when you, when you pay, you can actually adjust how much you want to go to each of those two different, um, you know, uh, how you want to say, uh, uh, charities. Okay, so let me see if I can get up here to the chat. And that way I can. There you go. So I posted that in the chat. Okay. And it's on a humble bundle. Um, and they, you know, they do this stuff very often. Even right now, if you did video editing, they have a video editor software that's up there as well. Um, they have cookbooks. They have, um, you know, stuff on becoming a better. Uh, um, uh, oh, wow. I'm trying to think of what it is, a coder. It's like coding for a computer. Um, yeah. But, you know, they did, they, the, the website started on video games. So, um, you know, just be aware, there's gonna be a lot of video games that come out with that on that website, but it's great. I love going to the website because I, you know, I'm supporting charity as well as getting these really good, um, these really good software That's for right. an affordable price. So like Luminar, which we were just looking at right here is $69 for the thing, but you can get it for 25 and get all that extra stuff. And if you didn't want Luminar, you can try and just, um, and get that photo lemur, the first one they had for $1. And if you decided, well, I don't really like photo lemur and I wanted Luminar after you decided you didn't want it, you don't have to pay 25 extra dollars. You just have to make sure that you raise yourself back up to the $25. So it's just $24. You're just paying the difference at that point. Um, but I mean, you can go down, they have all these other alternatives. Here's a free alternative called raw therapy. Yeah, um, I've heard about that. Mm -hmm. There's another one on one photo of raw, um, go through capture one pro. I can tell you the more affordable your, um, your software, the less powerful it is, as well as more often than not, the more confusing it is to get to learn. Okay. But if you get a, a software that's on sale, those are going to be a bit better. You're going to, it's going to be more affordable, but at the same time, it's going to also be, um, have more beef behind it. Cause they, I mean, they have the money to support the app, the software. Okay. okay. Um, and so, you know, if you ever really feel like, you know, I want to know, you know, if I wanted other Photoshop alternatives, you can do the same thing. Just Google that. Um, and, uh, just to show you what the GIMP photo editor looks like, it is, uh, the symbol is this thing right here. Yeah, I uh, actually use GIMP. Yeah, and it's, it's very popular. It's been around for a number of years. Um, when I was in high school, this was a big thing. Um, you can see it, but it has a lot of controls here, just like Photoshop does. It's, it's as daunting as Photoshop is, except that Photoshop has a lot of tutorials and videos and stuff that you can help you with. And GIMP doesn't have as good quality of, of stuff, stuff like that. You can go on YouTube and learn anything you ever want to know on GIMP, just as good as Photoshop. You know, you can put a, just as much effort into it and it will work out really well. Um, you know, it's just Adobe Photoshop just has, it's just better. You know, when you pay for something, it's going to be better than when it's going to be free. That's just a, a yeah. rule of life uh, yeah. really when it comes down to it. I've got an old copy of photo, um, uh, Adobe Creative Suite. It's like maybe version Creative Suite 2. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been using that all this time. It's just, I'm like, okay, right now, I, it's, I'm just not willing to. 
Yeah, and I would say the biggest issue with with um, with using the older one, it still definitely works great, but um, given today's photo sizes and, yeah. and the size of, of the data that you're moving through that thing, it's probably going to struggle. It's probably slower than it may have used to be, and it'll continue to get slower and slower as time goes on. So, buying something that's that's um, you know that I showed you today that's newer, you're going to get a better quality, and you don't have to buy you know Adobe. Um, I you know if you can great if you can't still great because there's still going to be opportunities for you to to do really well post editing without using Adobe. 